So for 20 years, I had a job caretaking penguins, as absurd as that sounds, and two decades in an Antarctic freezer has you become well acquainted with ice. Hearth, by definition, is a warm place. And could there be a place to raise family that's at once warm, but where other things are kept frozen? It said the Inuit tribe has 40 different words for as many types of snow, and I appreciate their thoroughness. Snow has certain, very different forms. We had a machine that created ice for the penguins, a gigantic setup with these digital readouts that analyzed conductivity within a briny fount, probes that measured salinity and temperature. The snow collected upwards in a large silo before finally being delivered into the exhibit. The thawing the ice every day took a few hours, time enough to think, could I be good or bad, depending upon the snow. It could be also good or bad, depending whether or not the pillow was kind of night price. My mind would wander. I remembered the article I read regarding these fast melting glaciers, the ice caps that have been disappearing for years. In recent times, the thaw has been more sudden. Everything in quick dissolve. The guano stained snow I flushed down the drain remained dumb parallel. Bodies and artifacts are unearthed with the glaciers melting, leathery corpses a color and wrinkle of dates. The bodies are sometimes as big as mastodons also exhumed on long, hibernated pathogens. These needling and small things which can suddenly aerosolize, becoming renewedly dangerous after eons of rest, long after we've lost immunity. My wife, Jen, asked over dinner one night, what happens when it comes back? The depression would ruin the cheese course. It was, however, an important question. Things have a way of returning. After thawing the exhibit for the penguins, I blow fresh snow, shiny white, in hopes of keeping the ground. <laughs> I'm soft-spoken, as you can tell. The ground frozen, at least. The light's streaming from the east now in this bungalow on North Park. The sun is arcing higher with the new year. I've always disliked the um, Easter light as shadows cast westward, reliably short beneath the front and east-facing windows. Shadows get stuck in the gable and beneath the plants. It's a stubborn circadian thing, my dislike of the morning. The sunrise's exposure, never a new beginning. I prefer the deep and base relief of a setting sun that a setting sun instead provides. It carves new places to hide comfortably. When Jen and I moved in together, two residences passed, there was a particular homesickness that accompanied our living situation. It was our first run at adulting. There were weeks when the bank account was whittled to three ninety-five. dollars Jen would often retreat home on the weekends to do laundry at her parents' house. There was a light there most hours. Our apartment, meanwhile, was always dark, even in the daytime. Sandwiched between two neighboring buildings, the apartment was forever in a constant and concrete eclipse. Even the fern died, though I watered it religiously. The real dark was best, come 6 p.m. or so. Out the front window, the step stairs disappeared and the next door lights clicked on, visible only between slats and the fence. The undergirding of the upstairs balcony partially blocked the front window. The view was minimal, a picket fence, two erstwhile hawthorn shrubs, and anemic bougainvillea snaking its way upward from our doorstep to the second floor railings. Nighttime was relief, always the stereo on and a record spinning, shallots and garlic hitting the pan. The kitchen was stubbornly harvest gold, though it was 2001. We witnessed 9 11 here. I played certain albums in sync with the upstairs neighbors, all these bands with suddenly questionable names and questionable song titles, while the towers fell again and again on television in constant repeat. My parents, they lived in Denver after Vietnam, and they opened their windows to the cold while playing Marvin Gaye's What's Going On. The third floor tenements did the same. Get old enough, you realize there may be only certain intersections of time and geography, things in sync where you feel comfortable. All this while your chemistries require accordance to a specific set of spatial and circadian demands. Me? I've historically disliked 3 p.m. 
I dislike Eastern Light, too. Also flat places, those cursedly flat streets with houses graded on the equal. I become agitated, agoraphobic, without walk-ups in the cover of trees. I furiously cook as if the alchemy of rue, flour, and fat becoming something gold changes everything, as if magic has a specific wellspring in the stovetop. When first looking for a rental house, Jen increasingly pregnant, Jen called me at work and said she found a place, the place. It was on Greg Street, and the house was nice enough, but with a pink ceramic bathroom and a screened-in back porch needing repair. The house was on a horribly even street. Remember, I hate even avenues. One block up from where a PSA airliner had crashed when the year after I was born. The plane, it scraped the street worse than level. The PSA had a crash in 78, leaving a memorial plaque on the sidewalk. A friend of mine lived one block east that exact year. Coming home from a shift at the local hospital, she found body parts on her front lawn. Her shift had already been burdened with body parts, so the forearm on her porch was something superfluous. How will our pulses end? How will they? I get scared they end with spines and teeth and things red-colored. I express my particular and neurotic no, a quiet shake of the head, and Jen cried in frustration because we've been looking a long time for a house in this neighborhood. It should have been a yes for me, pink toilet regardless. We did find a house, though, only a mile up. It had a young, hundred-year-old sycamore overhanging the roof, also I'd walk up to the front door. There was a gable, and the house was elevated. Had there been a pergola, some floor cover, it would have been perfect. In absence of a rosia bathroom, we signed the lease. Ten years later, it remains our home. It has a nice kitchen. Jim and I switched seats at breakfast. Jesus, this insufferable east light again, and the kids all ramped up. This was supposed to be the easy and enjoyable part of the day a Benedict before managing a drive the neighboring hills. Fins wrapped around my neck, caved something nonstop. There's also the fact of banging spoons and cutlery on the floor. Something's awakened, sprung like an instant thermometer, and the tintination of dropped silverware hurts the eardrums again and again. I really should be enjoying breakfasts. There are fork fills of goat cheese, stuffed zucchinis, balsamic tomatoes, I try to focus on the plate in front of me. I'm not doing well. The potatoes have herbs de Provence, and the Benedict is built atop a popover, so there is something lavender and airy about the plate. The poached eggs neatly trim their egg white tails. I still remain in disagreement with the strawberry reduction. Cade, meanwhile, has taken up a coloring book, his crayon cherry wax flavored. Finn's tucked into a pancake and has simply got maple syrup, a pat of butter. Finn's still in diapers, but he eats like a champ. I think the popover too eggy, the window too bright. On a Saturday morning, this is just way too much gray cloud thinking. I'm actually and restlessly critiquing the cook. We're going to look at houses to live in. I have to switch seats because Finn's pressing against my face now and his idea of a hug. His breath is something different with new and soft teeth, all puppyish, his mouth awkwardly open mawed against my cheekbone and lower eyelid. Jen and I switch seats. I eat my food while the kitchen hastens dishes to the front of the house. I continue to hate Eastern Light. I continue to be a jerk. I hate myself for this weed of agitation that keeps springing up. This goddamn agitation, god damn it. Roughly translated, Tierra Santa means holy ground. It exists behind the community where I grew up, on the northeastern slope of Cowles Mountain, nestled in the upper plateaus south of the airfields. It overlooks a valley that was long ago both dairyland and floodplain. The valley is now an unwisely engineered interstate with a parallel and adjunct business district, a thoroughfare lined with big box outlets and a mixed utility complexes. There's a murmuration of birds over the Best Buy, we see this from a ridge of the last town home we're both visiting and ranking, and the birds do their thing, a 
approximating the respiration of bellows, seeming to displace air on the needle in tight, the flock reducing itself to a line. Best Buy is neon at 10 o'clock in the morning, which is absolutely unnecessary in the daylight. The townhouses are okay, nice. Brass tacks about living in San Diego is downright unaffordable. We have money is passed down, that guilty thing we call inheritance. And while we meantime make a decent living ourselves, we still can't buy 800 square feet in a place we want, and really we don't want much. The only available option is to buy a house with a shared wall and with paid for maintenance. A shrunken patio is excused for a backyard and with communal pathways that could cross in front. It could be convenient. Something you might want as a 40-year-old if I'm going to the fixer-upper dream and while having a severe aversion to mowing the lawn, it could also just be a bummer, depending on how you convince yourself. It's this midlife compromise when you ask, does it really come down to this? Peggy Lee singing, is that all there is? Well, you hope the wall you share with your neighbor involves laundry or the kitchen, not the bedroom, because keeping things at half volume seems an unfortunate concession. To be 40 and fucking on the quiet seems something adolescent, not something belonging to a responsible homeowner with a mortgage. The walkway is nice. You don't have to do maintenance, at least. The birds do their best thing, or do their thing over the Best Buy, and the cottonwoods are grown up enough, also the sycamores. <coughs> the chaparral's relegated to the valleys. <coughs> The buckwheat repeating's uninterrupted seven-year bloom. When I was younger, all the news coming from Tierra Santa involved kids finding live artillery shells while exploring canyons, exploding themselves, just horrible news. And now Tierra Santa is houses upon houses of development, an implosion of living spaces. We drive around, there are exactly four strip malls, a pizzeria and a Hawaiian barbecue and a haircut store. It makes me really nervous there are so many houses and so few storefronts. What would it mean to be stranded with so few facilities and so few people you can greet at the counter by name? A guy at the last complex walks out of his garage with a white beard and a cigarette and he waves amiably. Jet washing jets land across the way and I get the growing sense that I don't want to live here. But I wave back to the white beard guy. He seems nice. As a kid, I used to sit in my neighbor's roof and watch the jets carom over Tier Santa during practice, the annual air show. At night, there were sonic booms unexplained because we lived near the airfield and there was a constant and midnight rumbling of secret planes taking off. The B-1s they wouldn't tell us about yet. Nighttime planes, I remember. Back at work, the snow was wet and coming up the hose all wrong. Too much salt in the brine, else too many clouds on the horizon. Humidity throws everything off when making stuff frozen. Penguins didn't care, and just reveled in the newfound ice. They wriggled around the slush, upset in the snow before it froze proper to the concrete. When I clocked out, the snow was messy, and a penguin barked. I get frightened. Sometimes really frightened for my kids that everything moves and near misses and that collisions are sometimes expected. That things are frozen and dangerously thought out. That there are extinctions upon extinctions, but also the not extinctions. When days go maybe according to plan, when it's sunny out, but when the leaves could either be in green unfurl else crisp. I wish I had a better house for my kids. I wish for hearth as well as things frozen. I can snap the ignition on the range top and get a blue flame. Still wish for a lesser color that doesn't burn so hot, one that doesn't melt the ice, one that doesn't release the awaiting pathogens. Could things be snowy, white? Could they be harvest gold? Could this and could this already be the place?